Greetings. Isn't it wonderful how um, God brings everything together? There's so many things that have happened in this service so far that is just reflective of uh, what the Lord's laid on my heart. Isn't he good? Yeah. yeah. I want to pray. Father, you've laid stuff on my heart and uh, I believe it's from you. Help me, Father, today to, to present it how you would have it to come across. Yes, yes. I commit it to your hands, Father. Help me to speak what's on your heart and I pray that hearts will be changed. Hearts will be impacted and changed because of what you say today. Commit it to your hands, Lord, in the precious name of Jesus. Mm. Thank you. Today, I wanted to talk about the kingdom of God and, and how that we're rewarded and uh, how we earn those rewards and such like. And I prayed and uh, sought the Lord for clarification and he kept on saying, no, not today. <laughs> he laid something very different on my heart and he just kept on prompting me with a very simple question. He just said, why, why do you love Jesus? Why do you love Jesus? That's a simple question, you know, and it should be very, very easy for us to answer, right? I assume that's actually the reason why most of us are here today, isn't it? You know? So, just let me ask you now, why do you love Jesus? All right? Just, just have a think about that. Don't answer it out loud. <laughs> Please, just, just have a think, because you, you might embarrass me. <laughs> you might be really. Just, just have a think for a minute and determine in your heart why do you personally love Jesus? Okay, so just, just put a marker in that point in your in this now and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll swim back to this later on so when I was eight years old I chose to give my life to Jesus and the church I was involved with at that time they had a process for anybody wanting to make such a commitment and uh, I recall it actually quite vividly and uh, I was interviewed for over an hour by two very senior members of my church who uh, wanted to ensure that this young whippersnapper was really true about his commitment to Jesus. It was just slightly intimidating for an eight-year-old. But uh, I can re can't remember much about the interrogation, and it probably was more of an inter interrogation than anything else. But except for one very blunt question, and one particular gruff guy asked me, why do you love Jesus, Sonny? That kind of hit home, you know. And I clearly just remember my response. response. It just came to me immediately. I just blurted it out. Because Jesus died for my sins. Apparently my answer was quite acceptable and I was uh, allowed to take communion, which was a very advanced thing those days for an eight-year-old but you see was that a correct answer is that just why I love Jesus it's very simplistic isn't it so what I want to do today is just let's explore together why what Jesus did and why we love him so let's start now at the beginning we have to turn to the book of Genesis and we read from chapter 1 verse 26 to 29 and also verse 31 then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on earth, the small animals that scurry on the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth, govern it. Rain over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Then God said, look, I have given you every seed for bear, each, 
every seed bearing plant throughout the earth and all the fruit trees for your for your food then god looked over all he had made and he saw that it was very good and evening passed and morning came marking the sixth day god created man and woman he blessed them and he really liked what he saw <laughs> it was very good the creation of man was the pinnacle of God's handiwork. The whole earth and everything in it, everything in the universe was created for human beings to use and enjoy. Man was given authority directly to, to directly govern, reign over the whole earth. Interesting, isn't it? He didn't uh, tell him to be, you better be a bit careful of Mother Nature because she might get the better of you. But uh, no, man was given total dominion. That's another story. We won't go into Mother Nature anymore. <laughs> Genesis chapter 3 verse 8. Then God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he planted the man he had made. The Lord placed the man in the garden of Eden to tend and watch over it, but the Lord God warned him. You may eat freely of the fruit of every tree in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. Mm. God put man in this beautiful garden that he just planted, and he gave him a job. Interesting, isn't it, that seemingly this garden contained fully grown trees with fruit ones, ones producing fruit all ready to be eaten. You know, if he didn't, man would have to wait quite a few years for his first meal, wouldn't he? <laughs> now, we, as we read on, we see that God made a wife for Adam. Everything was wonderful until along comes the serpent. The serpent lied and caused man and the woman to disobey God. The serpent was, uh, Genesis uh, 3, 1 to 6, the serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit of, the, of any of the trees of the garden? Of course we may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. The only one, the only fruit from the middle, it's only the fruit from the middle of the garden that we're not allowed to eat. God said you must not eat it or even touch it or you will mm. die. You won't die, the servant replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be open as soon as you eat it and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was deceived. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious and she wanted the wisdom it would give. So she took some of the fruit and ate it and she gave it to her husband who was with her and he ate it too. Verse 11 to 13. And the Lord asked, Have you eaten from the fruit from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? The woman replied, It was the woman you gave me. It was the woman you gave me who gave me the fruit, and I ate it. Blame game going on here, guys. Never happens these days, does it? <laughs> then the Lord asked the woman, What have you done? The serpent deceived me, she replied. That's why I ate it. Then we see that God cursed the serpent, the woman, and the man. You see, God was just being just and righteous. Immediately, he implemented exactly what he had told Adam. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. Hmm. It's just what God said. God, Adam ate the fruit, and he was sentenced to death. He, it's not that he might possibly die, or, but death was the only outcome. Once he'd eaten the fruit. The death wasn't instantaneous, but obviously we know that Adam and Eve, plus every human being, except for a couple of six exceptions, which we won't go into, being from that day forward, have died when their time came due. Everybody's died. What God said was absolutely true. And the day you eat it, you will die. They all die, right? God was very faithful to his word. Nobody gets out alive. Every person on this earth today 
is still under the same judgment. Until Jesus returns, every person on this earth will eventually die. The fact is an absolute certainty. Nobody escapes this judgment which God imposed on mankind for his disobedience. There is nobody who is righteous. Psalm 14, 3, 2 to 3. The Lord looks down from heaven on the entire race. He looks to see if anybody is truly wise, if anybody seeks God. But no, all have turned away. All have come become corrupt. Psalm 53 repeats that almost word for word. And there's an old adage. If it's in the Bible once, take note. If it's in the Bible more than once, then God's really trying to get your attention. <laughs> Just for good measure, Paul also quotes Psalms, these Psalms in Romans chapter 3. Isaiah re reiterates our hopeless position before God. Isaiah 64, 5-7 For since the world began, no ear has heard, nor eye has seen a God like you, who works for those who wait for him. You welcome those who gladly do good, those who follow godly ways. But you have been very angry with us, for we are not godly. We are constant sinners. How can people like us be saved? We are all inflicted, infected and impure with sin. When we displayed our righteous deed, they are nothing more than filthy rags like autumn leaves. We wither and fall. And our sins sweep us away like the wind. No one calls on your name or pleads to, with you for mercy. Therefore, we have, you have turned away from us and turned us over to our sins. What a state. That's how man is. With our very best efforts, it is absolutely impossible for any man to become right with God regardless of what we do before we die. Without outside help, without outside help, every man and woman will die in their sin. What a hopeless situation. So does it all matter if we just die? Won't they just end everything as we surrender to the irreversible blackness of death? What, what's man, that's what man would have us to believe. That death is just the end after that. There's just nothing. God, however, says differently. The Bible makes it clear that man is made up of spirit, soul, and body. It's only a body which dies. Our body was made out of the dust of the earth. It tells us that in Genesis 1. And it returns to dust when we die. Our spirit and our soul continue on, as Solomon so prolifically describes. In Ecclesiastes 10 and 11, uh, 3, 10 and 11, I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has set eternity in the human heart. Our hearts or souls are eternal. They never die. <coughs> Ecclesiastes 12, 5 to 7, which is talking about when someone dies, then people go to their eternal home and mourners go about the street. Remember him before the silver cord is severed and the golden bowls is broken, before the pitcher is shattered at the spring and the well wheel broken at the well. And the dust returns to the ground it came from. And the spirit returns to God who gave it. The spirit returning to God means it reverted back to his ownership. It's released from our body and God takes back control of it. Doesn't necessarily mean that God keeps it with him. So what physically happens when we die in our natural sinful state? For this, we need to flip briefly to the New Testament and uh, read directly first, a uh, first-hand account that Jesus gave about what happens to the dead. Let's have a look at Luke 16, 19 to 26. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple, fine linen, and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. 
Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. Now listen to what happens to the rich man. The rich man also died and was buried. And his, he was buried. His body returned to the dust. In Hades, his soul was still alive. And where he was in torment, he was being punished. He looked up and saw he could see. So Abraham, now interesting, he, he obviously lived after Abraham, yet he knew exactly who Abraham was. He was fully aware of what had happened in the past and knew people from the past. With Lazarus by his side, so he called, he could talk to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the finger of his uh, tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony. He could feel in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he's comforted here and you're in agony. Verse 27, He answered, He had heard what Abraham said. Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. He had a very clear memory. Let him warn them. He had reasoning. So that they will not come to this place of torment. He knew exactly where he was. Isn't this incredible? Remember, this is a first-hand real account. This is not a parable. This is actually what happens to the soul of every person who dies in their sin, according to the creator of the universe. This man was totally aware. He could see, talk, hear, feel, remember, and reason. Doesn't sound like someone that's just in a black void, does it? Also, this place Jesus is talking about here is only the holding cells while they're waiting for final judgment. The Bible tells us that after the great white throne judgment, all the wicked are thrown into hell. The place that God made for the devil and his angels. You can read about that judgment in Revelation chapter 20, 11 to 10. The Bible has a lot to say about hell. It's a terrible place. If you think that the place where the rich man was hurt was awful, it's not a patch on what hell is like. It's a hell of a place. <laughs> Literally. It's described as a place where the worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. It's so dark, the darkness can be felt. It's constant, never ending for all eternity. Billions and billions of years of agonizing punishment without any let up or possibility of, for, of ever ending, isolated from anything good. What a terrible world. And certain fate awaits every human being who has ever lived who dies in their sins. This is an absolute real place, just as it was back then. Everybody who dies in their sin goes there, no exceptions. Now this is a bit great, isn't it? You feel uplifted now. <laughs> Fortunately, we have a wonderful and compassionate God. He foresaw the hopeless state of man even before he created the heavens and the earth. Adam's fall didn't take God by surprise. The predicament was that man had sinned and the foreordained penalty for, for sin was death. But once man had died, it was too late. He had chosen his, uh, his only fate was then judgment. There was no way up. And God had to uphold that. Psalm 109, 19 to 21. Lord, help, they cried from their troubles. And he saved them from their distress. He sent out his word. The word, that's another name for Jesus. And healed them. <coughs> snatched them from the door of death. Let them praise the Lord for his great love and for the wonderful things he has done for them. God sent his word. It's another name for Jesus. We read that in John's Gospel. The word was God and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So on. 
Jesus, part of the Godhead, came to earth as the Son of God and lived a perfect life. Jesus was born outside the seed of Adam and therefore was not subject to the punishment God had imposed upon the human race because of Adam's sin. Jesus lived on this very earth for more than 33 years and never sinned once. Never even close, came close to committing one indiscretion. Absolutely perfect. Jesus then offered his perfect life as a substitute for all mankind. He died and his blood was given up and made available for the redemption of everybody who had ever lived. He rose from the dead and God accepted his offering. Yeah. Now that description of what Jesus did can come across quite clinical. Don't you agree? Jesus died, shed his blood for me. Yes, it's truthful. Yes, absolutely every bit of it. But it's kind of generic. Unfortunately, this is often how many Christians regard the death of Jesus. He died and rose again. Ho -hum. You know, you see often in churches where people have them hanging around their necks, the Jesus hanging on the cross just looks kind of sweet. He's just lying there. Lovely Jesus was anything but lovely. You see, Jesus didn't die and rose again. He bore the full penalty of our sin. He, the verse we read earlier in Isaiah 64 says that um, God was, had been very angry with us because we are not godly, us being all mankind. Jesus, when he died, endured fully all that anger. Jesus accepted God's full anger that was directed towards us and suffered the full wrath from God. We were all due for our sin. There was no sleight of hand, you know. God didn't make an easy path for Jesus. Jesus bore the full penalty so that we could be completely free from all the curse of sin. Hallelujah! Let's take a quick look at a, at a, a dramatisation of something like what he went through. Can we have that video now, please? That should have been you on that cross. That should have been me. Isn't that incredible? Mm -hmm. It just makes me weep when I see that, you know? Just what Jesus actually suffered mm -hmm. for our sin. Incredible. That's the true reality of the judgment each and every one of us deserved. I recommend you watch that full video sometime. It's The Passion of the Christ. It's a great movie. I watched the whole thing again last night. I've seen it several times. And even that clip there had several bit, gruesome bits out of it. It's, it was quite sanitised. But you may be thinking, just in case you're thinking that that's a bit over the top, you know, I don't really think that Jesus quite suffered like that. Well, let's have a look at some of the scriptures, see what the hell, how the scriptures describe it. Let's have a look at Isaiah 54, verse 14. <clears throat> but they were amazed when they saw him. His face was so disfigured, he hardly seemed human. And from his appearance, one would scarcely have known he was a man. This is talking about Jesus, the Messiah, suffering at the cross. You can still definitely see he was a man. It's 53. Hey? It's 53. Is it? Somebody put the wrong. You guys. Are... <laughs> I've got to check it out. <laughs> You're dead right. Thank you. King David prophesies about this in another way. In Psalm 22, verse 18 to 19, I'm pretty sure that's the right one. My enemies surrounded me like a herd of bulls. Fierce lines of Basham have hemmed me in like lions that open their jaws against me, roaring and tearing at their prey. My life is poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax melting within me. My strength 
has dried up like sunbaked clay. My tongue sticks, sticks to the roof of my mouth. You have laid, on, laid me in the dust and left me for dead. My enemies surround me like a pack of dogs. An evil gang closes in on me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I take, I can count all my bones. My enemies stare at me and gloat. They divide my clothes among themselves and throw dice from my clothing. Again, another fulfilled prophecy about Messiah Jesus. That language certainly isn't flippant. Jesus suffered all of that for me. For you so that we could go absolutely free <clears throat> i wish i had time to read the whole of uh, isaiah 53 but it describes so much of what jesus went through and it also confirms that his suffering was exactly what god intended the devil didn't take advantage of the situation and overdo things like he's known to do no God used the devil to inflict our penalty on this wonderful, innocent Jesus. Isaiah 53, 10, But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life was made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life and God's good plan will prosper in his hand. The wonderful thing is that Jesus didn't stay dead. God raised him from the dead, meaning yeah. God had fully accepted his offering yeah. and the sacrifice for our sin. Mm -hmm. King David prophesied of his resurrection in Psalm 16, 10 to 11. For you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. You will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasure of living with you forevermore. Jesus rose from the dead and currently sits at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Yeah. Now, here's something important. Because Jesus suffered and bore the penalty for all mankind's sin, does that mean that every human being is now clear from every future judgment and we can just get on and enjoy life? Logical question, isn't it? Absolutely not. There is one more critical part to this salvation story. Yeah. Remember earlier we read in Psalm 14, 2 and 3, the Lord looks down from heaven on the entire human race. He looks to see if anybody is truly wise, if anybody seeks God. Yeah. God is still looking, desiring all people on this earth to seek Him. God gave us free will. Yeah. We have the ability to make conscious and formed choices. Mm. Adam had free will, but he chose to disobey God and believe Satan. And he brought about all this because of his, dis his, his disobedience. Yeah. Many people might say, oh, if I'd been Adam, I, I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't have disobeyed God. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, of course, I would have stayed loyal to God, you know. I'm not like that. Well, God in his absolute... Fairness is all right then, prove it. <laughs> we each have to make a choice. Yeah, that's right. Make a choice, just like Adam had to make. Yeah. God is looking for those who seek him. Yeah. All he wants us to do is just come to him and repent, and he will do the rest. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. We read about, read about this in Joel. That's why the Lord says, Turn to me now while there is time. Give me your hearts. Come with fasting and weeping and mourning. All that God requires of us is to humbly come to Him and give Him His heart. Give Him our heart. Our soul. It's not complex. It's not difficult. Mm. He only requires us to, us to call out to Him in true repentance. Yeah. We're told to do this while there is time. Yeah. Time is going to, our, our life is going to end. Time is going to finish one day. That means before we die and are placed into the holding cells, awaiting final judgment. Once we're in judgment, in, in those holding cells, there's no going back. We can't change it then. There is an urgency to this. As nobody knows exactly how long we've got. 
We don't know. Yeah. Nobody knows. We hope, but we don't know. Yeah. But God's heart is so good. Yes. Look what else he says in John. Chapter 2, verse 32. But everybody who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. Praise the Lord. Everybody. Saved from what? Well, the context of that verse is the coming judgment. Every call, everybody who calls on the Lord will be included in the sacrifice of the blood of Jesus and set free from the judgment yeah. on the whole earth. That's good. Everybody. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God loves you immensely. He proved that by giving his own son, his own flesh and blood to save you, yeah. to save me. All we have to do is come to him and the effect of that sacrifice, and to come unto the effect of that sacrifice is to call out to God in repentance. Yeah. It's not very difficult, is it? Yeah. Just call out to God. Such a simple salvation. God did not make it difficult. He didn't. Now, there's so much more to God's plan for salvation for us. Once we're saved through Jesus, salvation is only the very starting point. Yeah. It's just the beginning. Did you notice this entire message of salvation that we've just heard was derived solely from the Old Testament of the Bible? Every bit of it. Did you realize that? With exception of the description of the afterlife for Jesus, the whole message of salvation through Jesus was sourced from the Old Testament. Mm. Never forsake the reading of your whole Bible. There's so much in there. Yeah. That message of salvation is expanded on immensely and the whole wonderful blessings of salvation are detailed, examined and detailed in the New Testament. But unfortunately we don't have time to go through the whole New Testament today so I'll just say read that. Please, recommended reading. <laughs> Read on. So let's circle back now and revisit that question that we asked at the start. Why do you love Jesus? Perhaps my wiser eight-year-old self knew more than I realised. Think about exactly what he did for you, what he went through for you. That suffering that we saw was just immense. What he went through for me, for you, to be free. Do you truly, passionately love Jesus? Do you love him perhaps because of all that he did for you, dying in your stead? Or perhaps you love him for all the stuff you get from him every day? Because he's with you every step of the way and helps you through all your hard times. Perhaps you love him for all the stuff he does for you. Uh, perhaps you love him because he's going to take you to heaven when you die. But aren't all those things true? Don't we love him for those? Of course. Of course they're all true. But they're not the reason that gives us certainty of the reason that we love him. Unless you've come to the absolute understanding that without Jesus, your situation was absolutely hopeless, mm -hmm. then your love for him will only be superficial. When the trials come, and they will, and the love Jesus you love doesn't meet your expectations, you'll fail. Your enthusiasm will not only be lukewarm, and he'll always be second place in your life. Salvation is only achieved by coming to Jesus, falling at his feet and crying out, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Mm -hmm. Of course, they may look different for each and every person. Nobody's, everybody's, nobody's the same. But that's the essence of what we do and say. Unless you've done that, then unfortunately you're not saved. You're still in your sin. And your only fate is a destiny in hell for all eternity. Now I know that's not politically correct to say that today. But that's a fact and it's an absolute truth. Yeah. That Jesus is the only way to salvation. The only way to salvation. Right. 
That's the message on salvation. But listen very carefully to something. Because this is the whole point of this message that God laid on my heart. <clears throat> this year, the Lord's been emphasizing to us that He wants us to go beyond. Go beyond our natural abilities. Go beyond our own thoughts, our own plans, our own desires. We will never achieve that by our own abilities. Urging us to go beyond is not some half-time pep talk by a coach urging his team to just put in a little bit more effort and more get the game won. No, Jesus gave us absolute all. That's right. Absolutely all. What are you prepared to give? Are you preparing to do the same? Give absolutely everything to Jesus. Everything we do must be driven by this great deep love you have for him because of all that he's done for you. It should be like a natural reflex response. When we see and understand and know what Jesus has done for us, it should be saying, Lord, whatever I can do for you. Yeah. If you love Jesus basically on solely what he has personally achieved for you at the cross, is your love based on that? Our salvation and walk with him is personal. And fortunately, we don't have to do it alone. Mm -hmm. We have his Holy Spirit within us to guide us. And he provides us with a, a like-minded church family to walk alongside with. Don't ever forsake your church family. That's, good. That's so important. Mm -hmm. Now, some of what we've been talking about may have actually challenged you today. Actually, I hope it really has. <laughs> Take time to dwell on what we talked about. That dramatization of Jesus on the cross, the price of what he paid for your sinful state, just let it burn in. Let it stay there. Now, if you're sitting here, or if you're listening online, and you, you don't really know Jesus already like this, and you have the strong burning within you right now, to give your life to Jesus. Don't wait one moment longer. That's right. Raise your hand to him right now and shout out aloud. Lord, I'm a sinner. I repent of my sin. I wholeheartedly submit to you, Jesus. And I declare you, the Lord, the boss, the king of my life. God bless you if you just did that. You've now entered the kingdom of God. Isn't that amazing? If you did it, let us know. We'll pray for you and help you on your journey with knowing God. That's good. God bless you. May each and every one of us be strengthened mightily in our walk with God.